Good morning, everybody. Do you know how fortunate we are? Do you know how fortunate I am, number one? Most pastors in churches, they have backgrounds, and they'll, they'll paint a wall so they have a good background for the live streaming. I got a window. So you can stare past me when you start getting sleepy, or if there's an eagle out there, you don't have to look at me anymore. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You got that view out behind us? Aren't we blessed? I hope you guys are blessed this morning. We get to worship the Lord together, gang. We get to come to his house and worship him. He is still on the throne. No matter what is happening in the world around us, God is in control. Let's open in prayer. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you and praise you that you are such a good God. And we thank you, Lord, that we serve the risen King. And Father, we just give you all of our worship this morning. We pray that you would rule and reign here, that your Holy Spirit would uh, inhabit the dwellings of, of this place, Lord, and that you would inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, I pray that everything that we do this morning is an act of worship under your throne, and that you would be glorified by our worship. We thank you, Father, and we praise your name, and we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And I'm going to ask Linda to come up and share the announcements with us. Linda? Wherever you're at, there you are. I'm behind, behind you. Good morning, everyone. Today is our Operation Christmas Child Packing Party. So if you brought your boxes or if you brought goodies that you want to help put in boxes, we will have that downstairs right after service, and we do have some goodies and refreshments. If you forgot your box, don't worry. Last, our next weekend is the last day to bring it in, so get it together this week and make sure that you bring it next Sunday, okay? So absolute last day is next Sunday. Um, Men of Valor. Men of Valor will be meeting next Saturday here at Mount Hall. It's 8 o'clock. We'll have breakfast and fellowship. And then after Men of Valor, we're going to have a church work day. So ladies, just come in with your men and sit around and visit, and maybe we can do a little other cleaning in different places. But we have the shed out here, the big white shed that needs to get cleaned up, go through boxes and sort that out. So we need a few people to help. Um, many hands make work light, so if you want to come for maybe an hour, maybe two hours and come help, it would be really nice to get that cleaned out. Um, and then we had a craft sale yesterday, so I'm going to invite Cheryl to come up and tell us how the Women's of Truth craft sale went. It went great. <laughs> <laughs> we had so much fun. I want to thank you all, all those that participated in it and all those that came and bought. Thank you so very much. Um, we do this once a year, and it's a way for the ladies to put, um, like, earn money towards conferences or, or retreats. And so what we earned yesterday was $1,389. Yes. yes. God was good as he always is, and we happened to have a location at the fairgrounds that was the first place you would go into before you went to the other locations. <laughs> so it worked to our advantage. And it was really a wonderful time. You know what? Every woman that had anything to do with the craft sale yesterday, whether it was prepare, whether it was shop, whether it was to serve, or whether it was to pray for that ministry, would you stand up, please? This is what we strive for here at Mount Hall, is that it is not one person or two people, it is the body coming together. And we, we were the ones that got so much out of that. We were blessed. We got to fellowship, we got to hang out with each other, we got to laugh, we got to get to know each other, and it was wonderful. So thank you very much for your support, and I appreciate it. At this time, will the ushers please come forward for the tithes and offerings? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to give back to you some of what you've provided us with, and I ask that you would bless this and use it to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'd like to invite you to stand and sing with us. Ah. 
I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deep is stain within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lift to thee, thou safe and high. Love lift to thee, love lift to thee. Thank you. 
Thank you, guys. That was an awesome time of worship, wasn't it? All right. So if you're a little one right now and you want to go downstairs for children's church, this is the time we dismiss our little ones. So let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you for this wonderful day that we have, Lord. I lift up our children to you, our, our grandkids, and we ask that you would bless them that you would plant your word deep in their hearts. And I pray for Miss Alethea this morning. I ask for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit on her, that you would lead her and guide her in truth as she teaches these youngsters. We thank you and praise you, Lord, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So make, yourself, make your way to the center aisle there, I should say. And I almost brought my coffee up. That would have made it better. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll spill it or I'll knock it over when I start trying to talk with my hands. So turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 25. Like so many other everyday things in this country, even our money today bears witness to the fact that our nation is a God-founded God nation, and it emphasizes the additional fact that as a nation, we rely on divine providence. On the dollar bill is a pyramid which represents the building of our country. The fact that it is broken emphasizes that our nation is not yet completed. And I think we can all relate to that today, can't we? Directly above the pyramid is an eye symbolizing the eye of God. This stresses the importance of putting spiritual warfare above material prosperity. Our founding fathers stood firmly, believing that our strength was rooted in God and that our progress must always be under the watchful eye of God. Another important symbol is contained in the words anuit coeptis. I'm glad I, I don't speak Latin. This would be tough. In a semicircle at the top of the seal, and referring to Almighty God, they mean that he has smiled on our undertakings. And finally, three Latin words appear directly under the pyramid, meaning a new order of the ages. That statement suggests that our nation, under God, is producing a new age in the life and the freedom of mankind. And may it always be so. Amen. Acts chapter 25, beginning at verse 13. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, it is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has an opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat, commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed, but had some questions against him about their own religion, about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed 
to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not specify the charges against him. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you that, that your word is powerful and true and, and alive right now, Lord, as we read your word and open your word, that it just leaps off the pages, that it applies to what we're going on in our lives today, Father. And I just ask for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit on me and also on this congregation, Father, that you would lead us and guide us in truth. I pray if I say anything that is not of you, that it falls to the ground unheard. We thank you, Father. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we began this chapter. We began our study in chapter 25. And we saw as Governor Festus takes over for Governor Felix. And remember, he got the lay of the land. He took survey of what was going on there first in Caesarea before going on to Jerusalem. And remember, when he went on to Jerusalem, the first thing that the Jews brought up to him, and when I say the Jews, it's the Jewish religious leadership, is what about Paul? Now, at this point in time, Paul had been in custody for two years. So the, the time right now is about 59 AD. And the Jews wanted him executed. They wanted to deal with Paul. But Paul knew, even as he sat in, in prison unjustly, he knew he was there by the Lord's design. We see this, this laid out later on in a letter that Paul wrote to one of his friends, another brother in the faith named Philemon. And this is in Philemon chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. So you see, Paul didn't say, I was a prisoner of Rome, did he? He said, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He knew that he was in jail, and it was part of God's plan. It was part of his design. And God was using that time that he was in custody to bring him before rulers and kings and those in authority to preach the name of Jesus. So he was right in the right place at the right time where God wanted him. Just like us today, as we are going through a world that's turned upside down and it's kind of crazy, and we're like scratching our head, we never would have imagined that we would be at this place in time. You are right where God wants you, all of us today, for such a time as this, just like it said in Esther, for such a time as this, we are here, right here, right now, today, to be a light and to be a voice and to stand strong for our faith in Jesus Christ and not to bow down to the ways of this world. You see, we're what the Bible calls salt and light, salt and light. So before I even uh, did my message, um, I was praying about all this, and, and God brought this on my heart about the salt and light thing. And then I come in this morning, and I just, every once in a while, I'll take a look at the bulletins that we have back there. And by the way, Erica, you do a great job on that. And I look up this, this uh, week's bulletin, and on the back page of the bulletin that she had picked out, what do I see but salt and light? So this is the kind of God that we serve. He works out these little messages, and he leaves breadcrumbs along the path there for us to find. Hold your place there in Acts. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 5, please. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 11. Blessed are you when they 
Who's they? The world, this world system, the devil, those representing him. When they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let me stop there for just a second. So during Israel's history, remember, they had the priests that would minister to the people. They would re represent the God to the people and people to God. They were a liaison. And they would also uh, represent the king to God. And the king, the prophets, priests, and kings were the Lord's anointed. But when a king wouldn't listen, when the government would fail and wouldn't listen, that's when God would send the prophets. And your life expectancy as a prophet wasn't very good. If you're not already doing it, join us in the daily manna as we read through the Bible together in a year, and you'll see that. The prophets didn't live very long. Isaiah got sawed in half. Jeremiah was called the weep weeping prophet. So often these prophets were imprisoned or they were killed. They persecuted the prophets who were before you. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine so before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So that means, saints, that means, gang, don't be silent. During this time when the world would want to shut us down and say, I don't want to hear that, you need to be unified with us. What they're actually talking about is not unity, but conformity. They're talking about surrender. And we will never surrender. We cannot surrender. We've read the book and we know how it ends. We win. Now, this past week, out of the blue, I had an old friend text me. And this is on instant messenger adjacent to social media. Now, most of the guys that I used to work with in law enforcement, they are ardent uh, patriots and conservatives, and they, they don't like what's going on in our world right now. But there are a few that I worked with, a very few, and this particular friend, and I love this guy, I trusted my life with him for years, he is a liberal. And so with everything that's going on right now, he, he sends me this text, and he, he questioned me about how my posts were going and how they are divisive. And how long was I going to continue to do that? How, how long was I going to spout this hate? Well, I, I try very hard not to put anything hateful on there. I do try to share what's going on in the news. And I'll put Christian uh, memes or memes, as you know, scripture that's on there. But I try to stay away from hate. And so I questioned him. And then we're kind of going back and forth, and, and Cheryl will remember this. This is right before bedtime, so this is not the kind of message that you want to get. We normally put fish mavericks on so we can laugh and giggle and have a few laughs before we go to sleep. But I started questioning my friend, and he said, you know, I, I believe in God. Uh, I don't know much about what the Bible says, but all the other preachers, all the other people that I know that claim to be Christians... They say, they speak only of, of peace and tolerance and unity, that we all need to be unified together. We all need to believe the same things. So you're different. Why are you doing all this stuff? So I had an opportunity to share with him. And I said, my friend, and I, I love you no matter what. We, are, we will always be friends. Nothing can change that. But Jesus Christ was the no, most divisive human being that ever lived. He came to planet Earth, and he made us make a choice. We had to decide. He didn't say that all ways get to heaven. He didn't say that you can follow through Muhammad or Buddha or be, by being a good person. He said, you must choose me. And I said, my friend, we're getting up in age, and you must research this for yourself. You must decide, because very soon we're all going to be standing before God Almighty. And the only thing he wants to hear out of our mouth is what we did with his son, Jesus Christ. So, Jesus, as he was the most divisive person in history, if we're speaking the truth in love, and we're standing together as Christians, and we're salt and light, and we're not going to back down, and we speak the truth, and we don't be silent, and we don't conform, just because the world wants us to, we're going to be hated, aren't we? We're going to be pers persecuted. Jesus wrote 
or excuse me, he didn't write it, Matthew wrote, but Jesus said it. And this is in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36. This will be on the screen. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Gang, we're right there right now, today, in this world that we live in. Families are split and divided. And this is not just over politics. This is our whole way of life as people. If you're a conservative Christian following follower of Jesus Christ, you will be persecuted in this life. And it's only going to get worse. This is not about politics, but it's about darkness and light. Darkness and light. And the Bible says you are that light. You, your little Christ, your Christians, and you're just put a spotlight on evil when it comes up. That's why when somebody swears in front of you and they know that you're a Christian, they say, pardon my French or excuse me, because the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you convicts them of their sin. You're representatives of our Savior, Jesus Christ. You are the salt that preserves our world. Now, in the time of Jesus, they didn't have refrigerators, did they? They didn't have freezers. So if you were going to get fresh meat or fresh fish, then you had to coat it in salt. Salt was a preservative. Salt was something that made the meat taste better, but would also keep it from spoiling. So today, in our world, in America today, Christian, you are the salt and light. You're the only thing that is standing in the way of the Antichrist taking control of this world right now. Did you know that? When you're taken out of here, when we go home, when Jesus says, come up here, that's, the, that's what's going to take us out of the way and allow the enemy to take control of planet Earth. That's why he's the God of the, the air, the God of this world. But his, his t- term, his term of office is only for a short season. So keep that in mind. Now, this morning, we continue in our line-by-line and word-by-word study of the book of Acts. My message title is The Stand like taking a stand, part one. So let's begin, Acts chapter 25, verse 13. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. Now where we left off last week, remember Festus, he gets back from Jerusalem, and he says kind of, let's get on with it, and he calls Paul out, and he allows Paul to once again be put on trial here. And the Jews, they level more baseless charges, more charges without any any witnesses or evidence or any kind of testimony being presented against Paul. And then Festus, now notice this, this is Festus. This is, he's not any different from the other ones. But he says, he's playing to both sides, Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and be tried by me, be tried before me? Now, Paul doesn't just say no, does he? He says, "Uh uh-uh, no way, no way, no how. Heck no, I'm not going. I appeal to Caesar. So in the meantime, several days have now passed. And then we see this guy, King Agrippa II and Bernice. And they come to Caesarea. And they hang out there for a while. Remember, Caesarea is a Roman town. This was built by Herod the Great, and this is where the Roman dignitaries and their families would live. There were a few Jews, but mostly Roman. Now, Agrippa II, he is the grandson of Herod the Great. Remember that wicked guy. This was the one, Herod the Great, that tried to have the baby Jesus murdered. This slaughter became known as the slaughter of the innocents. Remember when he found out that the wise men had tricked him and they went home another way. He sent the temple guards over to Bethlehem and he instructed them to kill any child under the age of two. And this went down in history as the slaughter of the innocents. But God told Joseph in a dream, take baby Jesus and take your wife Mary and go to Egypt. In the Bible, Egypt is always a type of the world. It's a picture of the world. And then when it was safe, when Herod had died, God again tells Joseph in a dream, it's okay, it's safe, you can come back to Israel again. And the the apostle Matthew records that this fulfills a great prophecy. And this prophecy is over in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. This will be on the screen. And notice there as we're reading this, God the Father, our God, he always makes himself one with Israel, also one with Jesus in this case, the Messiah. 
one with his people. He's the God of the land, God of the people. Three in one. The Holy Spirit's in there too. When Israel was a child, and this is speaking of Jesus, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. So remember, Joseph, he brings Mary and Jesus back into Israel. They come into Judea. And then Joseph learns that uh, Herod's son, a guy named Agrippa Archelaus, and this guy also had a reputation as being a cruel tyrant, that he was ruling down there in the south. Remember, uh, Joseph and Mary are both from the tribe of Judah. And Judah has its land holdings. It has its place down in the south, down in Judea. That's where Jesus was born, Bethlehem. That's Joseph's hometown. That's why he had to come back there for the census to be registered. That's where his people are from. So he sees that there's danger there, and instead he says, no, I'm going to take my family, and let's go up to Galilee. We'll, we'll start a family up there. And they go up to this town of Nazareth. And that's where Jesus, from that point in time, became known, especially to the Jews who used it as a put-down, as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Agrippa's father, Herod Agrippa I, you might remember this guy because we read about him back in Acts chapter 12. Now, in Acts chapter 12, Agrippa I, this is Agrippa II's dad, he comes out, and this is in Caesarea, and he is wearing all silver. He's wearing a garment, and he kind of probably resembled one of those Christmas trees from the 1960s. You might have seen pictures of them. They were all of tinsel and aluminum, and they twirled around and had all kinds of lights on them. I remember when I was a little boy, my mom had one, and it was a spectacle. And then the motor broke, and we threw it out. It wasn't any good. But remember the people, they looked at him, and they were, they were committing the sin of flattery there on Agrippa. And they said, oh, you're awesome. You're a god. You're just like a god. So Agrippa, rather, and he was raised as a good Jewish boy, rather than say, no, praise be to God, he accepts the praise himself. He accepts the praise as God. And what does God do to him? He strikes him so that he dies by worms. Now, in the text there in Acts chapter 12, it makes it sound like that he was struck right there on the spot and eaten by worms right in front of him. But what actually happened was, over a five-day period, he was eaten slowly. So this was a slow, painful, miserable death. That's what happened when, happens when we take God's glory. Because God is on the throne. He is in control. And he doesn't like to share his glory with anybody. He is a jealous God. And so now we look at his son, Herod Agrippa II. And his full name was Marcus Julius Agrippa. He sounds more like a Roman than he does a Jew, doesn't he? Remember, names mean something in the Bible. So just like his grandfather, Herod the Great, he is named Marcus. This is after Mark Antony. And the name Marcus means that that person is a follower after the Roman god of war, Mars. The middle name, after Julius Caesar, the great Roman emperor. And this is also indicative that the Herods, and I'm including all of them in there, their great patriarch or benefactor was Mark Antony. Mark Antony, the lover of Cleopatra, queen of the Nile. Now, we always picture her as being an Egyptian, don't we? But she was really a Greek. And remember, they took poison as opposed to being taken into custody by Augustus. So in Rome, Rome elevates this guy. And Agrippa II, he actually is raised up. He's raised by Caesar himself. He goes to school with a guy by the name of Nero. That was his best buddy, his best friend. And Nero, remember, he's the one that burned Christians. He was a persecutor of the church. So eventually Agrippa gets put in charge, and he gets little postings here and there. He's a client king, but he represents Rome, even though he's considered a Jew. So finally, he gets posted over the region of Galilee and Phoenicia, which is present-day Lebanon. And he's put in charge there. Now, Agrippa had a palace there at the Sea of Galilee, right on the ocean front. Now, that's what I, I, where I would have hung out. But his headquarters was really in a place named Caesarea Philippi. And if you look on the screen, there'll be a couple of photos there. And this is from our trip that we were there a year ago now. And this is way up in the north of Israel, right on the border with Lebanon. Now, you see that big cave there, right there on the side of the cliff with a hole in it, that cave? That is called the gates of hell. 
And this is where Jesus actually had taught his disciples. And he spoke to Peter in particularly when Peter said, where are we going to go, Lord? You have the word of God. You are the son of God. You're the Messiah. And Jesus told him and said, this didn't come just by you stumbling over it, Peter, but this is by inspiration of God's Holy Spirit. God told you this. And then you know the story right after that. Peter said, far be it, Lord, you're not going to have to suffer and die on the cross. And just as quickly, Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan. You know, so that's, that's where we have to always be careful as Christians, not to get puffed up with our own press clippings and believe ourselves. Peter went from hero to zero in a New York minute. But what did Jesus say? The gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. Now, in that time, that big hole there, the Jews believed that's where, where demons and Satan would come up out of that hole and come up to earth to torment people. And Jesus was making a statement that even hell will not prevail against his church. His church, us, you and I, we will not suffer the wrath of God through what's known as the Great Tribulation. Because God does not change and God cannot lie. And his word is true forever. It goes forward. So that big hole in the rock, the gates of hell, right next to that, in this, this little city up there, Caesarea Philippi, this is where the Jordan River actually begins. It's actually beautiful. And there's a trout stream there. That's what it, the Jordan River looks like. You could actually see the trout swimming in the water. It's crystal clear and clean. And then if you just go a few miles down the road going down the Jordan, it gets slow and muddy very, very quickly, doesn't it? So we see Agrippa, that was his base of operations up there, and he brings his queen with him. And this lady's name is Bernice, Queen Bernice. Now she shares power with Agrippa. She's also a client regent, if you will. She also shared his bed. Now you might say, Bob, what's so significant about that? Because a queen and a king, they sleep together, right? They're husband and wife. No, not in this case. Bernice is Agrippa's sister his sister. She is his queen, but he's also, that's his sister. So this is an incestuous relationship that no doubt had the people of Israel up in arms. Because as a Jew growing up in Israel, you're required to follow the law. Remember, you got the Pharisees out there. They're the religious police. And then you see this king that's supposed to be over you, and he is living like a Roman and doing anything that he wants to do. So this would have been scandalous. So remember a few weeks ago, we talked about all these royal relationships, these, it, and it read like a soap opera. Remember that? Remember Governor Felix? He was married to Cleopatra's granddaughter. Remember her, Drusilla? And that was the first Drusilla. And then he left her, divorced her, and he married the second Drusilla, who was an Israeli, a Jew. Now, Drusilla number two, that's Bernice's sister. So this is kind of like all, all my people or whatever, whatever one of those soap operas. I don't even know the names of them. This is all my children, all my people, whatever. <laughs> so Bernice and Drusilla are sisters and everybody's sleeping with everybody. And so our happy couple, they come to the new governor, Porcius Festus, and hang out for a while. Now, as we go on in our verses this morning, I'm going to compact some of these verses because they're all a recap. And this is the, the, the way of writing in that time, the biblical way of writing. The Hebrew, it's called parallelism, where they are redundant and they go over it again and again and again. Now, when we see that in the Bible, it's important to remember, when God keeps repeating something, that's because he's trying to get it through my thick head. He's trying to make a point. So I'm going to go over this kind of quickly, and I'll make some footnotes in there as we go over it. Verse 14, when they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, It is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction, and that means death, before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has an opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. This sound, if this sounds a little bit similar to our way of our justice system, our rights under the Constitution, you're right. Because this all comes from our predecessors before us. So we have the right to face our accusers, don't we? 
Nobody can stay anonymous when they accuse you of a crime in court. You have the right to due process. You have the right to a trial, all those things. Now, what we're seeing in the cancel culture today is an attack on that. Now, what happened with George Floyd? No doubt about it. I think we all agree that was wrong, it was criminal, and it needed to be dealt with. And the courts should handle it. And that officer that did that, or former officer, he stained his badge. He brought shame and dishonor on my profession that I came from, and he deserves to be punished. But subsequently, all those riots that happened after that, and some of the law enforcement shootings that took place, particularly in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and also in Atlanta, Georgia, if you look at the videos, particularly one man armed with a knife and another one who had taken a taser away from the officer, then the shootings would, under the law, the way the law actually reads, those would be justifiable shootings. But what we see with our media right now is they want to skip through the due process rights that we all have as Americans and go right to condemnation. They want to just throw out all these rights and say, let's just kill them. Let's charge them all with murder and be done with it. So this is wrong. This is evil. This is evil from the pit of hell. Verse 17, therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed. So the governor would have been expecting such things as theft or murder, rape, burglary, true crimes. Instead, what he gets is they're not worshiping God the way that we want them to worship. Paul is not being a good boy. Now, Paul claimed all things Jewish. Remember when he had testified before? He said, I believe in the temple. The temple's a good thing. The law and the prophets, I've been taught them since I was a little kid, and I preached them. And I'm fully Jewish. I'm also a Roman citizen, but I'm Jewish. And he also, and this is what really bugged them, is he preached Jesus that he was the promised Messiah. And he showed with Scripture where it says that he was the Messiah. And that's what it was all about. This is what bugs these priests. Because Jesus is competition. When Jesus says, you no longer have to go be through all these priests, but you can come boldly before the throne of grace and mercy and receive communion with the Father, then it kind of cuts in on their business model, doesn't it? All those Sadducees and the Pharisees, because they were getting out of a job because of their unfaithfulness to Scripture. Verse 19, but had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Now remember, when Jesus resurrected from the tomb, when he came back from the dead, who did he present himself to? His followers. He presented himself to his disciples, to his followers, those that believed in him. He presented himself to the church, or what be would become of the church. But those who crucified him, both the Jews and the Romans, they never saw him. They heard the rumors, and of course they spread other rumors and said that his body was, was stolen, that it was taken. They tried to uh, elicit this big fraud thing, and they actually bribed the soldiers that were outside the, uh, the uh, tomb when Jesus rose again from the dead to, perpetu perpetu to put forth that lie. Where's my coffee, honey? <laughs> so bottom line, Paul should have been acquitted when all this was going on, but these guys didn't have the courage to do the right thing. Remember, the Roman tribu tribunal, Commander Claudius Lysias, he declared... Paul had done none, nothing worthy of death or imprisonment. Then Roman Governor Felix, he also said the same thing. He declared it. And now we have Governor Festus, and he recognized that Paul is also falsely accused. And it kind of reminds us of a picture of Jesus Christ. You know that he went on seven trials before he was actually crucified, back and forth between Herod and also the Roman governor. Pontius Pilate, he said the same thing about Jesus Christ, and yet he lacked the courage. He lacked the courage to do the right thing and said, you're innocent and set him free. I like this quote by Michael Joseph Josephson. And Michael Josephson, if you're not familiar with him, he does all kinds of things on management leadership and effective, uh, effective ethics, I guess you would call it. He's a Jew, but he really nails it with this. 
Character is the moral strength to do the right thing even when it costs more than you want to pay. Let me say that again. Character is the moral strength to do the right thing even when it costs more than you want to pay. Now, we might call that your ethos or your ethics. And being ethical is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Now, none of these guys, even they, though they knew the right thing, none of them were willing to do it because they all would have lacked standing. They would, it would have cost them something. It would have taken something away. It would have taken their reputation away from the Jews. And they were riding the fence. They were being typical politicians trying to please everybody. Just like today, gang, we cannot please everybody in this life. You're going to make one angry and one happy. No way around it. And when you ride that fence, when you try to please everybody, you're ineffective for both. You're in no man's land, essentially. The world would say all of these men, all the ones that I just mentioned, had arrived. They had power, they had money, they had position, they had authority, and yet none of them had courage, which was the most important thing. Now, our leaders and politicians today, do you see them keeping their word? Let's talk about the Congress. What was, what's their approval rating? I think it's down in the teens right now. And you often see them, they ride the fence and they talk out of both sides of their mouth so that nobody believes them and nothing ever gets done. Even when one of these high profile people, let's mention the Clintons, when they commit something that looks like a crime to us, do we ever see justice being done on somebody like that? It seems like there's one standard of justice for us and another standard of justice for those that are in power and authority. That's one of the things that people both love and hate about our president. For whether you like him or not, when he said that he was going to do something, he did it. He appointed three conservative Supreme Court justices that are going to actually adhere to the Constitution. And when President Obama had left over 140 vacancies in the appeals court, assuming that Hillary Clinton was going to be the next president and that she would fill him, he, he kindly appointed conservatives on those, on those positions so that our Constitution would be upheld. Whether you love or hate the man, that's quite an accomplishment. Now, bear in mind, and this stat is according to the Washington Examiner newspaper, over the term of the last four years, the president had made and kept 319 separate promises. That's more than most of them do in, in, in two terms time. And the world hates somebody when you don't just go along with the system. Imagine you're working at a job, a job that you don't really like and you're getting paid a low wage, and you do what is only necessary. And then all of a sudden, somebody gets hired, and they're the energizer bunny. They're always working, and they're, they're performing and outperforming you, and you can't keep up with them. And it forces you, in order to keep your job, to do a better job at yours. Well, you're not going to like that person, are you? It's going to expose you for what you're doing, which is very, very little. It's like when, I, when Cheryl and I went on the mission field in both Albania and Russia, both of these were communist countries, and they had a saying, the communists pretended to pay us, so we pretended to work. And boy, was that true. Very, very little got done. Well, when you have somebody that comes in and they, they're not conforming to their way of doing things, and suddenly they're outperforming everybody else, you want to get rid of that person. Now, in our text this morning, we have a Gentile pagan governor speaking to a Jewish client king or ruler, and he is curious about their religion. He just got there. He knows very little about it, and he's certainly curious about this guy, Jesus. Now, Jesus was a very common name in that day. It was the Greek version of the name Joshua, and Joshua, of course, it's the same as Yeshua, which means just Jehovah is salvation. But there were a lot of people named Jesus, and he's talking about the one particular Jesus who had been crucified over 30 years before that, and people were, st were still talking about him. People were still in an uproar about him. Remember, Paul going over to the Gentile world in Greece and in Turkey, he had been accused of turning the world upside down. And yet, we have this Roman governor that comes in, and he knows very little about Jesus, the same Jesus that was causing such a stir. And this is also a warning and a reminder to us today. We cannot assume, we cannot assume that people know about Jesus. Just like my friend that I told you about on the text message. He believed in God. 
He believes in being a good guy, but he had never heard about Jesus. Now, when I answered him back, by the way, I didn't talk to him about politics, but I shared the gospel with him, and I shared scripture with him, and I planted those seeds so that he could look it up for himself. Because none of the stuff that I'm talking about is really about our way of life or the Constitution or our world system. This is really more about dark versus light. And everything boils down to the gospel. It boils down to what we do with Jesus Christ. Do we stand up for righteousness? Do we stand up what it says in the word of God for freedom and liberty and freedom of speech and freedom to freely practice our religion, our faith? Because right now, what's being tried to be toned down on social media about politics, very soon, if the election stands the way it is right now, the next thing that's going to go, they will come out after Christians. They will try to shut down our free speech. They'll try to shut down pastors so that they can no longer preach the word. Because it's hateful, and it's xenophobic, and it's homophobic. And it's all these things that the world says about Christians. So we cannot assume that people know anything about Jesus, and we have to be salt and light to them. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call in him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And shall they, how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? So today, church, Christians, dear friends, my job as your pastor is to teach you up and to train you, to equip you for the ministry. And what I mean by that is I come here on a Sunday morning and I teach from the Word of God to the best of my ability. But my job is to teach you in such a way you read it for yourself and then you go into your world, you go into the community, and you talk to people that I cannot reach or that wouldn't listen to me, and you share Jesus Christ with them. That's the way this works. You are the evangelists. You point people to the truth, to Jesus Christ. Now, Agrippa II, he was considered to be an expert in the Jewish law. And he was actually given the power by the Roman Caesar to appoint the temple priests. Now, this was a, a complete disruption of the way the Jews had intended things in God's word. God had laid out specific order for the way the priests were appointed. And it was done for life. And it was according to what the word of God said. But the Romans have come in and taken that power away and they give it to Agrippa to appoint the temple priest. So it became a political appointee position. So rather than teaching the word of God, they were teaching the word of Rome and they were getting rich by doing it. Now remember, in addition to the sexual immorality that we just talked about by Agrippa and Herod and all these guys, the Herods and going all the way back to Herod the Great, they were not full Jews. Herod the Great had married one of the daughters from the Hasmonean dynasty. Now the Hasmoneans, I don't want to get too much into history there, but there was a point in time where the, the Jews were actually able to throw off the domination by the Greek Empire. And that's where we get our Hanukkah celebration that Jews follow at Christmas time, where the oil lasted longer than it was supposed to. And then for 150 years, the Jews had independence and they started appointing kings again. Not under the line of David, but they had their own kings. So then in come the Romans and they take charge of, of Israel once again. But they still maintained that Hasmonean dynasty and Herod, he married into that and he converted to Judaism. But to the everyday average Jew on the street, Herod was an Edomite. And an Edomite was not well liked. They were not trusted at all. And so this would have also brought distrust from the people and scorn. So... In Psalm chapter 108, verses 8 and 9, this will be on the screen. God said, Gilead is mine. That's referring to Israel. Manasseh, one of the other tribes, is mine. Ephraim is the helmet of my head. That indicates Ephraim was the head of the northern tribes of Israel. Judah is my lawgiver. That's the royal line, the tribe of Judah, from where Jesus came from, and David. And then verse 9, Moab is my wash pot. How would you like to be referred to as a wash pot? Over Edom, I have cast my shoe. Over Philistia, that's the Philistines, I will triumph. So verse 9 is not very complimentary, is it, of these peoples? Remember the video of President George W. Bush back in 2008 when we were in the Iraq War? 
okay? And an Iraqi reporter threw a shoe at him. Up on the screen, you'll see a photograph of that. Well, in the culture of the Middle East, and this isn't just the Jews, but it's also the Arab countries surrounding that, throwing a shoe at somebody or even showing the bottom of your shoe is a great insult. It's an affront. So to a Jew, an Edomite serving over them, this would have been a thorn in their side. They would not have liked it one little bit. As a matter of fact, our guy Agrippa II, when the Jewish-Roman War started in just a few short years after this, guess whose side he fought on? The Romans. He was actually given a medal by the Roman Empire as a cavalry officer, he, and he actually fought against his own people. So he's not a very nice guy, but he's considered to be an expert in the law on Jewish religious matters. So our guy Festus, he's curious about Paul, and he's curious about Jesus. Verse 20, and because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to, to Caesar. So Augustus, Augustus Caesar, he lived probably about 50 years before this. But what this is actually speaking of is even though Nero is emperor right now, he is considered under the dynasty, what we would call the dynasty of Augustus Caesar. He's not blood to Claudius. Remember, the Claudius was his stepfather, but he was encouraged by Claudius's wife to appoint him as the heir, even over his own natural-born son. So he's under that dynasty of Augustus Caesar. Now, this meeting before Agrippa and Bernice, this was not a trial, not like we looked at with Jesus or even the one previously with Paul, but this was a hearing, and it was more like a spectacle. It was entertainment for Agrippa, because Agrippa had no jurisdiction there whatsoever. And Paul, being a Roman citizen, he had already appealed to Caesar, so whether Festus agrees to it or not, he's off to Rome. There's nothing that Festus could do to it. That was his right as a Roman citizen. At this point in history, the Emperor Nero was actually thought to be a wise man. Like a lot of leaders, like a lot, even a lot of pastors and churches, he began very well. He was considered to have ruled wisely. But a few short years after this, he would become a madman. This was the guy, remember, he would burn Christians as candles alive, coated with wax in his garden. And he blamed the burning of Rome on Christians so that he could rebuild Rome in his own name. Neuropolis is what he wanted to call it. So this guy, Nero, even killed his own mother, and he killed his stepbrother, Britannicus, because he was the rightful heir to the throne. So Nero is referred to here as Augustus only because he's of that royal line. Verse 22, then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and prominent men of the city, at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. Now on the screen, you're going to see a photograph of the auditorium there. This is what it looks like in Caesarea. Now this is in the typical Greek amphitheater type uh, layout, the way that they would do it. And this is actually the same amphitheater. It survives even to this day. Now imagine that you're Paul, you're Paul the Apostle, and you're brought out. Now you're down there at the very bottom, you're in the dirt, and everybody, that whole auditorium is filled up. It's filled with people, it's filled with Romans and Jews who don't like you very much. This is a hostile crowd, and everyone is looking at you, and everyone is sneering at you, and they're looking for a reason. You can almost see they're, they're tasting blood. They really want to see this guy get killed. What would you do? And how would you do? How would we do? Well, the Bible tells us all, each and every one of us as Christians, to be ready. To be ready to give an account of the hope that lies within us. To be ready in season and in out. Second Peter chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. If you're not used to speaking in front of people, this could really be intimidating, couldn't it? You know, you put all this pressure, you're pressure, on pressure for your own life, but on top of everything else, 
you've got to be true to the word. You want to you want to share Jesus in an effective way. So Paul, he's going to keep it simple. Paul is going to give his Jesus story. He's going to tell his account of what what he was like before God and how Jesus got his attention. And today as Christians, each and every one of you sitting here today has your own Jesus story. And I encourage you right here, right now, have a short one, two minutes or less, where you can just make the point, this is who I was before Christ, and this is what he's done in my life after. And then have a longer one, where when you have dinner with somebody and they ask for your account, they ask for your story, so you can share what God has done in your life. You may not be able to quote chapter and verse for all these scriptures, but you all have a story. And you can all reach people that I cannot reach. And so get your testimonies together right now. Be ready so when God calls on you, when he puts you in that situation, when he puts you in that circumstance, you're not intimidated by it, but you're ready. Give an account for the hope that lies within you. Verse 24, And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. They wanted to kill him. And when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. He really didn't have any choice. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, that I may have something to write. For it seems reasonable to send a prisoner, excuse me, for it seems unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. And of course, I'm thinking, why not just release him? Then he doesn't have to appeal to Caesar. That's the right thing to do. So it's kind of like, really, Festus? That's the best that you can do? You want to put on this big show so it's entertainment, you, so you can write a letter to Nero and tell him why you're sending him and dumping him on your do- doorstep? Why not just say to Paul, tell us about your Jesus? Please, we have questions. We want to hear about Jesus. Why are you doing all this? You had a life of leisure. You were on the fast track to promotion as a Pharisee. Why did you chuck it all to follow after Jesus? You know, we can understand that, but this is injustice right before our eyes. And make no no mistake about this, this is a hostile crowd, not a friendly one. So Paul is about to take the stand for Jesus Christ. Next week, we'll actually see what Paul says as he makes that stand. But this morning, my fellow Christians, it's time for us to take a stand. It's time for us to be vocal. This world is not our home. And the Lord's return has got to be, it's got to be extremely soon, very close. And people, our fellow Americans right now, they're believing the lie. And should the results of this election stand, should they actually be certified? And I'm not sure that they will as you're watching all this because there's a number of of challenges that are being made, particularly on the computer system that was used, Dominion. But if it does stand, this will be the most leftist, the most socialist, the most Marxist and anti-Christian government in the history of our nation. And we will be headed for tough times ahead. Persecution will be coming. So we need to be ready, and we need to make a stand right here and right now and not let the the world silence our voice. But remember this. Jesus told us that we would have power. That's the promise of the Father. Remember, as we've been studying in Acts, the most important verse in Acts, the whole book, is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I will give you power, dunamis power, the word we get dynamite from that you may be able to be witnesses of me in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. That means that we'll be able to stand and he will give us the courage to do so if we only tap into him. John chapter 14, verse 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So when you're put on the spot, when you have to make that stand, God will bring scriptures to remembrance. He'll bring things that happen in your life for your testimony so that you can effectively share Jesus Christ with those around you. 
So when you're put on that spot, don't fear because God is faithful. And then you'll be able to give an account why, as the world calls you a hater, someone who ruins the world's fun, all these lies that they call you, God will give you the strength to speak, and he'll bring the scripture to remembrance that you can use as a mighty sword in your hand. And this morning, if you have not begun that relationship, that all-important relationship with Jesus Christ, I hope all this doom and gloom and prophecy stuff, I have not scared you away. Because as I said, I've read the end of the book, and we win. These guys are going to lose. We're on the victorious side. All we have to do is hold the ground. We have to take our stand. The enemy, you see, he's nothing but a rebel, and he's attacking us, and we have the position of power and authority. God promise us, promises us eternal life if we trust and believe in his son, Jesus. And Jesus is coming back soon, so don't get left behind. If that's you this morning, and you have never asked Christ to be your Savior, do it today. The Bible says that if you want to go to heaven, if you want to be saved, you must be born again or born from above. And that means simply this, trust that Jesus is who he says he is. Believe that that he was crucified for your sins, and that he was the only man in history, the only person, the only God that could raise himself up from, from the dead. And he promises if we believe that, he will also raise us up to eternal life. As Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, if you've never asked him to do that before, for you, for you this morning, do it today. What have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? Shall we stand together and shall we pray together? Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, that your word is true and powerful, and it's able to change us. And Lord, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, especially those that are watching over online on the internet right now, Lord, I just pray for the, these people that have never asked you to be Lord and Savior before, that right, where they were, that right where they're at, wherever you're watching, that you would trust and believe, that you would receive Jesus in your heart. And it's as simple as saying, God, forgive me. Come into my life. I choose to follow you all the rest of my days. If that's you and you're watching online, do it today. Just say a simple prayer. Jesus, I need you. Forgive me. I want to live forever. I want to go to heaven with you. And if you say that and you believe, then God is faithful. He will not leave you stranded. You will be born again. Your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. And if you're here at Mount Hall this morning, and that's you and you have never begun a relationship with Jesus Christ, as we are closing right now, the prayer teams are down front. Come and pray with somebody. The Bible says, Jesus said, that if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, if you're ashamed of me, I will also deny you before my Father. So I think it's important that we take a stand. I think it's important this morning as we close that we use this opportunity to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus and say, I'm on his team. So if that's you this morning, come on down. Come pray with me. Pray with somebody else. Ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And if you have prayer needs this morning, if there's things going on, you need prayer for healing or the loss of a job or you need a job or a promotion or whatever it may be, come down and find somebody to pray with. Father, we just thank you and praise you during this last song. We give you praise and we worship your name. And we ask that you would move mightily right here and right now. In Jesus' name, amen. For thou
because she just finally accepted Jesus. No. <laughs> I couldn't resist, honey. Hallelujah. <laughs> no, before, uh, before I give the benediction. <laughs> by the way, I might need a couch someplace. <laughs> For a long time. For a long time. No, my wife has an announcement I'm she wants so to pass sorry, on. I'm so sorry, you guys. I, I am tired. I forgot to tell you that we have stuff downstairs um, for the, from the women's uh, craft sale that is there. It's, it's marked down, I've been told. So Christmas is around the corner. Please come down and look at it and see if there's anything that you'd like to purchase. Don't go and anywhere. You are in so much I know trouble. I am. I know I'm, <laughs> I'm dead again. <laughs> Our benediction this morning is from Romans chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. Now may the God of hope, <laughs> I need that. <laughs> now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, and I pray your blessings on my brothers and sisters that you would watch over and keep them safe, Lord. Use them in a mighty way as they go in to affect the world for Jesus Christ. Have your hand on them, Lord. Keep them safe and bless them abundantly. And we ask it all in Jesus' holy name, and all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. See you later. That's bad. That's bad. That's bad.